is there a massive planet hidden in our solar system? It's hard to imagine how we could miss a whole planet when we've identified galaxies millions of light years away, but you have to appreciate the scope of the solar system and how easy it might be for something the size of a planet to be hiding in it. I'm Ashley Christine and here's how it works. Planet Nine is a hypothetical large planet believed to be hidden somewhere in the shadows way out in the outer solar system, well past even Pluto. It's predicted to be about 20 times farther away from the sun than Neptune, meaning that it could take 10,000 to 20,000 years for a single orbit. For comparison, Neptune is only 165 years. Its makeup would probably be similar to Uranus and Neptune, a gas planet, icy with a solid core, and around the same size or up to 10 times the size of Earth. Coined in the early 1900s by astronomer Percival Lowell, Planet X is a kind of generic term for an unknown planet yet to be named or maybe discovered. Planet 9 is the newly proposed name for a specific planet affecting the orbits of small icy orbits in the Kuiper Belt. So in this case, Planet X and Planet 9 are both roughly referring to the same thing. It might seem like a stretch to believe anything that large could be out there without us knowing about it, but there are some irregularities suggesting that something large could be tugging on on other celestial bodies. If a planet is too far away and too dim, then there is plenty of space for it to hide. A planet is a dark grain of sand in a cosmic ocean. The best way to find it is how we found Neptune, with mathematics. In 1821, no one knew that Neptune existed. There were only seven known planets at the time. Then astronomer Alexis Bouvard published his observations of Uranus's orbit and noticed that when it should pop up in a certain location, it didn't. Something was disturbing its orbit. He suggested that there was another planet to be discovered. Two mathematicians working separately in France and England attempted to solve it mathematically, and both of them were pretty close to predicting its location. But it wasn't until 1846 when astronomer Johann Gall used a telescope to confirm its existence. Fun side note, this is the version from Voyager 2. It's the deep blue image of Neptune we've all come to recognize, but in actuality, its color is more like Uranus. It's a misunderstanding that just got out of hand. What's interesting here is that several other astronomers had already observed Neptune as well, but because of its slow motion relative to the stars behind it, they didn't realize that it was a planet. To the victor goes the spoils. The discovery of Neptune not only represented a triumph for Newtonian physics, but it also marked the point when mathematics and theory rather Rather than direct observation, began to take the lead in astronomy. Pluto was discovered less than 100 years later in 1930, not with math, but with photographic plates and a telescope. But as we all remember the drama in 2006, it was demoted to the status of a dwarf planet. According to the International Astronomical Union, a celestial body must meet three qualifications in order to be classified as a planet. One, it must orbit a star. In our case, this means the sun. Personally, I think this will change as we discover more rogue planets, which are the size of a planet, some even bigger than Jupiter, but they don't orbit a star. They kind of just zip through the void without a home. They could have formed early in their solar system and been violently ejected, or their star died and lost the ability to hold on to them. A rogue planet could eventually be captured by a star again, or it'll roam the darkness forever. The second requirement to be a planet is that it must have sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, or big enough to be round enough. Hydrostatic equilibrium is not only the largest term I knew when I was eight years old, it is also the balance between conflicting forces like gravity and pressure. This balance creates roughly a spherical shape. It's kind of like blowing a balloon where the latex is acting like gravity pushing down and the air inside is the pressure pushing out. Roughly equal distribution. In the case of planets, it helps being larger so that there is enough mass to have enough gravity to crush down into that spherical shape, which is why we're round and asteroids are not. The third requirement and why Pluto failed is that it must be large enough to clean up the neighborhood. <laughs> Pluto, which is smaller than some moons, still has junk near it. A lot, actually. Pluto is located in the Kuiper Belt, similar to the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter in that it's a bunch of space junk. Except instead of rocky materials, the Kuiper Belt is full of icy ones. This is one of the sources for our comets. It is also where some anomalies supporting the possibility of a Planet Nine can be found. 
The Kuiper Belt is a collection of leftover parts from the early formation of the solar system. It is a donut-shaped area beyond the orbit of Neptune full of comets, asteroids, and other random chunks. The Oort Cloud is different. That's farther away and a fully encompassing orb surrounding the solar system rather than just a flat plane inside of it. The Oort Cloud is also another source of our comets. Some of the chunks in the Kuiper Belt do not orbit the sun like they should. A few of them have highly elongated orbits and or inclined orbits orbits, meaning that they're always above or below the orbital plane of everything else. This is the same kind of thinking that caused astronomers in the 19th century to believe that Neptune was hiding in the shadows, something large tugging at something else. Sedna, for example, the light purple line, is a dwarf planet about three times farther from the sun than Neptune and has an extremely elongated orbit. Some theories suggest that it got hit by an Earth-sized body in the solar system's early formation or something pretty big is still still tugging at it. Planet 9 is a convenient explanation for this strange behavior, not only for the elongated orbits of bodies in the Kuiper Belt, but their unusual groupings too. Planet 9 would probably have an elongated and inclined orbit as well, making it even harder to find. Because if it has an orbit of 20,000 years and it happens to be in the farthest spot right now, it will be smaller, dimmer, and blending in with other stars. Although it's believed to be a bit closer to us right now. Even if Planet 9 is as large as predicted, it could have an atmosphere composition that is just not all that reflective. Gases like methane, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia absorb visible and infrared light, reducing our ability to detect it. It is a needle in a haystack. There are a few theories to how Planet Nine would have gotten there. The first is that it's been there the whole time, that it formed alongside the rest of us while the sun was still getting its act together. Some scientists don't really like that explanation because it would require the solar system to have stretched out too far. Another explanation is that it was once part part of a different solar system, ejected as a rogue planet and then captured by our sun's gravity. But modeling suggests the odds of that are pretty slim because it would have to intersect us at just the right angle. The most popular theory is that it was formed with the rest of the planets, but it used to be much closer to the sun. It could have been pushed back by Saturn's orbit, hit by a celestial body, or tugged from nearby stars. It should be noted that Planet Nine is not the only explanation for unusual orbits. Another theory is far more uncertain settling primordial black holes. There are a few different types of black holes, like stellar, supermassive, or intermediate. You thought they were all the same thing, but they're not. The nightmares continue. Primordial black holes are hypothetical versions of a black hole that would have formed in the early universe just seconds after the Big Bang. In those first few seconds, the conditions were just hot and dense enough to have formed black holes ranging in size from a microscopic speck to 100,000 times the size of the sun. As the universe expanded and cooled, the conditions to form black holes like that would have ended. Primordial black holes have never been observed in nature. They may not exist at all. Maybe they did at one point and slowly evaporated over time, especially since the lower mass black holes evaporate quicker. Or there are still some left behind, but only the big ones. If there was one in our solar system, life would go on as usual. Contrary to popular belief, black holes aren't vacuum cleaners sucking everything in. Objects don't go just straight in, they orbit. There's a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, and we're not on a straight line toward it, we're in orbit. So for a primordial black hole the size of an orange to affect us, we would need to be directly in its path, which the Earth and all the other planets are not. A primordial black hole would also be incredibly difficult to detect. And while it is a possible explanation for the strange orbits in the Kuiper Belt, there's also the possibility of genuine randomness, that this just happened to happen on its own. Or it could be detection bias, as in looking in areas where we expect to find this sort of thing. It could be something about gravity we don't know yet, or even dark matter. But until when and if it's discovered, we just don't know. You might be wondering why we don't just point our telescopes at where we think it might be and just find it. But there are only a few telescopes in the world that could handle a job like that. And they all have tightly packed and competitive schedules. Even a professor at Caltech may only be allowed three days out of the year. And what if it's cloudy that whole week? Everyone wants to play with the fun toys, but they are in limited supply, sensitive to weather, and have other priorities. The hope is with the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile, going online sometime next year. It will provide some clarity into the happenings beyond Neptune. One of its missions is to map our galaxy, take an inventory of the solar system, and compile images and catalogs thousands of times larger than anything we have today. If anything is going to find a hidden planet, 
it's this. Planet Nine is a solid answer for some of the questions we have about our solar system, but until such a time, if and when its existence is confirmed, it remains just a mathematical model. <laughs>